Hi, I'm Thomas Bowles, Prince William County Agricultural Extension Agent. Welcome to our video. Okay, we're right about 11 o'clock. Uh, good morning and welcome. Uh, just a reminder, if you could keep your uh, microphones muted, uh, we're recording this. So if you miss any part of this, uh, it'll be up on YouTube probably by the end of the week. Um, if you have questions, please put those in the chat box and we will get to those at the end. So today's topic is, is your backyard green, or today's topic is, is a backyard greenhouse right for you? Um, we'll talk about greenhouses and maybe some other options that might work for you. So first, a little bit about Virginia Cooperative Extension. For those who don't know, we are a partnership between Virginia Tech and Virginia State and the localities. And our mission is to get research-based information out to the public. In Prince William County, we have programming in parenting, financial education, nutrition, 4-H youth development, and environmental and natural resources. Uh, one minute. One thing I'd like to mention, too, is that those of you who were pre-registered, we're going to be sending out a class evaluation um, later on this week. If you didn't pre-register, if you could please email us and re request one. These are helpful in figuring out what our future programming classes are going to be, and it helps us be accountable to our funders, both locally and at the state level. Another reminder, healthy soils make healthy plants. So you want more information on healthy soils, please visit virginiasoilhealth.org or forthesoil.org. Now, this is what everybody dreams about when they think of a greenhouse. You know, light open, you've got lots of plants growing, everything looks neat and orderly. This is actually a, a greenhouse in Brentsville High School here in the county. Um, and this is what we'd like, but a lot of times, particularly in a home situation, this is not what we get. So we're going to talk about the ins and outs of greenhouses and, again, some alternatives uh, if you're not quite ready for a greenhouse. So some things to consider. First of all, is your HOA going to allow a greenhouse? Um, the last thing you want to do is put a lot of investment into your greenhouse and have your HOA tell you to take it down. Think about what you actually want to do with it. How are you going to use it? Can you get water and power to it? Will it be large enough to accommodate your need? And finally, is it truly going to be cost effective? So first thing we want to think about when we're building a greenhouse is where to site it. Um, consider where you're getting sun, both in the summer and in the winter. Um, remember, the winter sun is going to be closer to the horizon. Um, you, can, you can orient a greenhouse north to south. It, it doesn't provide as much shade in the summertime, um, and it's kind of uneven shade. Or, excuse me, it's even shade, though, throughout the greenhouse. In an east-west orientation, uh, there's going to be one area that gets all of the shade, and in the winter that can be an issue. Um, but if you're not keeping very many things over in the winter, that is not as much of a problem. So once you've sighted it, you need to think about, okay, how am I going to, how am I going to build it? And we start at the bottom at the floor. There are lots of different materials that you can use. Um, some people use gravel. Some people use concrete. Some people will just leave the native dirt and grow right into that. Um, I would advise not leaving native dirt if you're going to, if you're not going to plant in the ground, I wouldn't leave the native dirt. I'll just say that because it can get muddy and the last thing you want to do is, is have your greenhouse be a mud trap. Now you can do it, as I say, in ground, you can use containers or you can use benches. And in the examples we have here in the pictures, we've got an in-ground system, container system, or excuse me, this is the bench system up here in the upper right. Um, these tomatoes, you can't see the containers, but they're actually on the, on the floor there in that gravel floor. 
and that's from Virginia State University. And when we're thinking about that, we want to think about how high our plant's going to get. And we'll talk more about ways that you can deal with plant height. Um, are you using annuals or perennials? And what physical limitations you might have? For a lot of people, a bench system is a good system because it reduces the amount of bending. So that's something you can think about. Think about what shape you want it. Um, for the home, it really doesn't matter a whole lot unless you're attaching it to the side of the house, in which case you, it's not going to be a full um, symmetrical greenhouse. But think about the shape you want it. You want it to be able to slough off snow, and depending on where you are, that may or, or may not be a concern. Um, but you definitely want it to be able to not have a heavy snow load on it. You want it to be able to shed that. I've been in situations where the greenhouse has collapsed under snow, and that is not a fun situation. Whoops. Think about the size. Um, you really want, when you're sizing a greenhouse, you want it as wide as possible because you want to be able to extend it um, lengthwise. It makes it easier to go lengthwise than it does to make it wider. Um, think about the plants you're going to have in them. Are you going to have enough space to reach all of them? So think about walkways. Um, and with those walkways, think about, can I get a wheelbarrow through? Can I get any other equipment I need through? A general rule of thumb is to allow one square foot per six inch potted plant plus walkway space. And generally speaking, most home greenhouses are built too small. So you want to think about what you're going to do, do a little math, and then add a little bit more just to make sure that you've got enough space. Another thing we need to think about is how are we going to glaze it? And glazing is the transparent, translucent covering um, where we let sunlight in. Traditionally, greenhouses have been made of glass. Glass is heavy. It is expensive. Um, it can be made weather tight, though. Uh, it is subject to breakage. And usually that's not a whole lot of problem if it's, it's one of those things that if you have juvenile delinquents in your neighborhood, there's a chance that they're going to throw stones at it and break it. Um, but other than that, uh, breakage is rare except in heavy hail situations. Um, and it's very transparent and allows a lot of the light in it on a single pane. If you're double planing it to have um, more insulation value, uh, it's going to reduce the light transmission. Um, generally speaking, we want a light transmission of 80% or better. So another alternative to glass, or an alternative, would be fiberglass. It's not as heavy. It can be pricey. Um, fiberglass, it's, it's important to think about what grade. You pay for what you get. And the cheap fiberglass is going to discolor over time. But fiberglass in general, if you get a high-grade one, um, you're going to end up with something that's easy to install and strong. It's got good light transmission. You can get fiberglass in a variety of light transmissions um, from close to clear to translucent. Um, so fiberglass is an option to think about. The cheapest option is polyfilm. It's very lightweight, it's inexpensive, it's relatively easy to install, but it only lasts for a couple of years. And a lot of times in a poly system, we double layer it, um, which can reduce the, the light transmission. Uh, not so much that you can't grow anything, but it does, it's, how do I say this? It's not as ideal as some of the other glazing options. And we double layer poly film because we want the insulation value. But you can single layer it. So now you've got your size, you've got your siding, you've got your flooring, you've got your glazing. How are you going to frame all that? Think about your structural materials. 
If you're doing glass, you need to use aluminum and it's really expensive, especially these days. Um, actually, all of these options are expensive these days with the recent price increases. Um, galvanized steel is another option. Pressure treated wood can be an option. Rot resistant wood can really last a long time. The only problem is it can be really expensive, especially these days. And it can be hard to find depending on what area you're in. And we're talking about like redwood or cedar. Once you have all that, you need to think about, well, how is the air going to move? And you need air to move because it helps regulate the humidity. It helps with heating and cooling. It helps with pest control, oddly enough. Um, and it helps with plant strength. If you have a plant growing where there's no air movement, the stems are going to be fairly weak. If they're forced to fight against the wind a little bit, they're going to have good strength, especially when you transplant them out into the garden or sell them or whatever you're going to do with those plants. Um, so you want cross ventilation. And there are lots of different fan and vent systems from very simple to very expensive. And there are many online size, ca size calculators that will allow you to accurately, based on the size of your greenhouse, get a fan that's going to be good enough to move that air for you. And so in the picture above, we've got an example of a greenhouse with fans on either end to help with airflow. Uh, the picture below is actually in Afghanistan. It's a, uh, great, a raisin drying facility. Uh, it looks very primitive, but um, it's really effective because the airflow is set up such that all of these little windows in here allow for enough air movement that inside that building, not only do you have a lot of good airflow to keep mold down, but the temperature is probably 10 to 15 degrees lower than it is outside. Uh, that picture was taken on a day when it was 100 and something, probably 115. Um, walking into that building is like walking into air conditioning. So if you've got the airflow right, that can help with cooling, especially in the summertime, because that is one issue we do have with greenhouses is that summertime heat. Speaking of heat, temperature is important to control um, in a greenhouse, and that's one of the reasons we do greenhouses, is because we can control the temperature. There are lots of different heating systems, from forced air systems to heat maps to passive heat banks to um, radiant floor systems like you would have in a house, which can get pricey. Um, humidity, actually, in cold weather can help keep in the heat as well. On the cooling side, we can use shade, we can use vents, we can use fans, and we can use evaporative pads to help cool down that greenhouse. Again, airflow is very important. So here are some passive systems. So over on the upper left, we have these glass systems that for heating, these are big glass windows. Heat comes in, stays in. Fairly simple. Over here, these banks of barrels, they're filled with water, painted black. They're at an angle such that in the wintertime, the sun's going to shine on these, going to heat up the water, and slowly that water's going to, or that heat is going to be released throughout the night into the greenhouse. It's not going to make it super warm, but it will keep the air temperature above freezing. Another way you can do it. For passive heating, again, you've got your normal greenhouse action. You roll a thermal blanket on it to help insulate it. And as the sun heats up this brick wall during the day, nighttime, a thick brick wall will release that heat back. You've got your thermal blanket to trap that in. And again, you can keep that temperature up above freezing. On the cooling side, there are some really primitive options, um, like this pot. You've got a clay pot within a pot, sand in between, a wet cloth over top. You pour water into that sand, and as the sand evaporates, that pulls heat 
and it makes the inner pot very cool. Very primitive refrigeration system, but it works. Um, this is a, an example of an evaporative mat. The mat is basically acting like the wet cloth here. Um, it also has some sand on the edges all around where water is poured in. And as that water evaporates, again, it's going to act as a cooler. More active systems are heating, actual heaters. Um, this is a propane-based heater. Um, you can have different fans. This is a forced air fan um, that forces the air through a cylinder that's got holes in it. And so that spreads the cooling throughout more evenly throughout the greenhouse. Um, you're going to have banks of fans depending on how cool you need to get it. Um, this is an evaporative pad that's actually an, an active system where water is pumped up and continually wets the pad as it dries out. So you have continuous evaporation. In a system like this, once it evaporates out, you've got to re-wet it manually. This system in the lower right does it automatically. Another thing to consider is how are you going to support your plants? It depends really on on what kind of plants you're going to have and how you really want to treat them. If you're just growing starts, you don't have to worry about that too much. If you're growing things actually in the greenhouse um, to full fruiting, then you have to think about supports. And so we have two systems here. This is for tomatoes. This is for uh, cucurbits. And these are cucumbers. Over here, we've got them already vining. Alpatrellis. Here, these are younger ones that are about to um, be put on this. It allows you to grow vertically and it saves you space. On this particular type of tomato uh, setup is kind of interesting because you've got the vertical and then you've got a slant. And the idea is you can grow the vines out on a slant to make them easier to pick. And as far as supports, you can use nets, you can use straight wire. There's a roller system where as the plant starts to vine, you kind of roll it onto it and you raise that roller up as it goes. It's a little bit complicated for me, but um, the wire system works really well. Nets can work pretty well. The problem that you sometimes get into is that things get a little too wound in the nets and, and clean up after the season can be a little more tricky. Um, personally, I like the wire myself, but choose what works for you. Another thing to consider is watering. And there are lots of ways you can water. You can use a hose. You can use sprinkler systems. You can use... Uh, drip irrigation. This in the lower right is an interesting, it's kind of high tech and you won't really see it in home greenhouses, but this actually waters from the bottom. So you put your plants on those tables and it forces water up and the water by capillary action goes up into the plant. Another thing with watering to consider is what is your water source? Is it going to be a tote that you have to fill up regularly? Is it going to be from a pond or a river? Is it going to be from your well? Or is it going to be from city water? And you have to think about that in terms of both water quality and how much it's going to cost you. And if you're using a well, you really need to think about how much water your, your pump can put out. If your well is not producing a whole lot of gallons per minute, then you can easily dry your well out if you're not careful. Some things you can do in greenhouses, um, you can operate hydroponically like we see here on the left. You can do aquaculture in a greenhouse. Aquaculture is really handy in a greenhouse. It keeps the water warm enough where you can have fish all year round. Or you can do a combination of aquaculture and hydroponics, or aquaponics, um, where you've got fish, and that fish waste is actually feeding and fertilizing your plants. So there are lots of things you can do with a greenhouse if you really want to. Um, my advice would be to start simple 
and then work your way up to some of these more complicated systems. Another thing to consider are your utilities. Do you have enough power to operate your greenhouse? Do you have en enough water, which we just talked about? Do you know how much it's going to cost you to install water or power and how much it's going to cost to operate it? Those are all things to think about because you don't want to put a lot of money into a system that you're not going to get a, a return on. Pest control is another thing to think about. Uh, and integrated management is really the best pest control. Um, that is where you're scouting for insects, you're identifying them, and you are getting rid of them with the least possible or the least toxic option as quickly as possible. The reason for that is that once pests get into a greenhouse and get out of control, it's difficult to deal with them because a lot of chemicals can't be used in a greenhouse. And some chemicals can only be used in a greenhouse with respirators. And, you know, especially in a home situation, do you really want to have to put a respirator on and a chem suit and all of that silliness? Um, it's not really silly, it's safety, but um, integrated pest management is really the best control. So again, you want to consider your HOA is going to allow it. What do you want to do with it? Water and power. Will it be large enough? And again, this last bullet is the thing that you really need to think about. Is it truly going to be cost effective? For what you want to do with it, is it going to be worth the investment? For a lot of people, it's not worth the investment. And I'm not saying that to dissuade anybody. I'm saying that to be pragmatic. Greenhouses can be expensive to build. They can be expensive to operate. And again, it depends on how many bells and whistles you have, but it can get quite expensive quite quickly. So what do you do if you want to have something like a greenhouse but not put all the money into it? Well, there's some options. They're referred to as season extenders. And basically, they allow you to jump ahead in the calendar or jump back depending on what season we're talking about. And what we want to do with a season extender, so for example, we're late September. Um, so we're at the end of planting for a couple of things. We passed the planting date for a number of things. Using a season extender, we can extend that season, extend that warm period. So basically, you're kind of going back in time by putting plants in something with a season extender, you're kind of going back in time and allowing an extended period for planting. And also it will extend the harvest. So here is a hoop house, which looks a lot like a greenhouse, but the difference is it doesn't have power. A greenhouses are basically powered. They may have lights, but they have powered environmental controls. You'll notice there aren't really fans here. The only ventilation comes from rolling up parts of the side. This is from Virginia State University, and these are papaya plants that they're trying to grow and see how well they work in our climate. Let's talk a little bit about the hoop house in more detail. It's also called a high tunnel. The simplest hoop houses you see out there are made with either PVC or steel conduit. They're bent over, poly wire, or excuse me, polyfilm covered. Um, you've got some wooden structures on either end. They don't cost as much as a greenhouse. You, you do see the same pest issues, but again, you, you just need to think about um, your IPM strategy. Are they more maintenance? In a way, yes, because you don't have automatic systems like fans. You have to manually roll up the sides. You have to manually open the doors every day um, to get that cross ventilation. But in the end, they are less expensive. Um, they do have the disadvantage of not having an active heat source. And so a lot of times these are double wrapped or double polyfilmed. Um, not always, but sometimes they are to try and hold in the heat. And we talked about passive systems for holding in the heat, if we go back, 
oops, up here, a barrel system in a uh, hoop house will work just as well as one in a greenhouse. So it's something to consider. Um, it's not something that really, though, that you're going to keep plants in all year round. Now, you can use low tunnels, and low tunnels are basically high tunnels or hoop houses that are only about waist high, maybe chest high. Um, and again, they're good season extenders. We use them in the spring and the fall quite a bit. Uh, you can, depending on what you're actually doing, they can either be poly coat or excuse me, polyfilm, or they can be spun cloth. Um, spun cloth is typically used to exclude um, pest insects in the spring. We see that with cucurbits a lot. Um, Poly, on the other hand, is going to be used in the wintertime to keep things a little bit warmer. Um, they're really inexpensive. They're really easy to do. A lot of times you can just do it with bent wire. If it's a really low tunnel, you can actually cut up a uh, wire coat hanger and use, bend that and use that as a support. Um, if you want it a little bit higher, you can use PVC pipe. Uh, not quarter inch, the one inch PVC pipe is really easy to bend to make a hoop. Um, you need, generally you would drive rebar where you're going to put it, and then you would bend it over, place it on, and you got a nice hoop that's sturdy and durable. Another option is a cold frame. And cold frames are great. This is old school technology. Um, Again, you've got the issue of manual temperature control. You've got to open it and close it manually. Um, but this is a great thing to, if you've got old windows or glass doors, it's a great thing to recycle and use in this. And basically, this is a mini hoop house when it comes down to it. Um, it's just basically in box form. Now, you can go a little bit what's the word I'm looking for, a little bit more advanced um, with hotbeds. And hotbeds is simply a cold frame that's got heat. And you can go from really old school to really tech, uh, depending on how you want to do it. And how hotbeds have evolved over time, if we start here at the left, and actually you'll see this system uh, at Colonial Williamsburg, where green manure or fresh manure is put at the base, it's covered with soil, it's got window sash over it, plants go in here, and as this manure decays, it gives off heat, heats the soil, so it's getting heat from the bottom and from the top, and you can grow a variety of things in there to extend the season. Later in the 1800s, they came up with an idea of using hot water and steam to do a similar type thing to heat the soil from the bottom. Later we used um, a more modern system, but basically it's, it's using hot water to heat that soil. Um, and the really high tech way to do it these days is to use control, power controls um, that will turn it on and off with the thermostat underground heating cable like you would have for radiant heating in a home. This is the more pricey way to go. Um, but if you just have, you know, some heat source, that's what makes a hot box, not a cold frame. And then probably the simplest of all season extender are cloches. And these have been around for a long time. And originally they were, glass bells, and you put them over each plant. The problem with cloches is they are very plant-centric. So you put it over an individual plant. That means however many plants you have, whatever maintenance you need to do, you need to do it that many times. So if it's a hot day and you need to vent it, then for every plant you have, you're going to go out and individually vent them. And then at, at night, you're going to individually close them. 
as I said, they were originally made out of glass. Um, we see a lot of them are made out of plastic these days. You can make your own with, and recycle a variety of plastic bottles. Um, they're good for winter sewing. Um, they don't provide a whole lot of, of heat holding. Um, so you have to be careful of that. You also have to be careful if you look at this picture in the upper right. Um, if you get too much moisture trapped in here, you run the risk of getting some mold and fungus. So that's another thing to keep in mind. So I've got a bunch of resources for you. Um, and it looks like uh, Linda put in a Penn State season extenders for fall, fall vegetables. Um, but these are a bunch of other ones that are useful. And with that, we'll take questions. Any questions today? I, I only saw the reference one so far. Do you want us to just shout out? <laughs> sure, that's fine. Sure. Um, so I'm curious. I'm I'm really just looking for something like right now I start my seeds in the basement under grow lights and mm -hmm. I'm just looking for if there's a way to do that outside. Is that something that we would need a greenhouse for or is that something we can use one of these extenders for instead? That's something, well, it depends on how early you want to start them Okay. and what your climate is. So where are you from? Uh, I'm down in Blacksburg, Virginia. Okay. So yeah, you have a, a late winter like we do. Um, you, you can start them in a hoop house, uh, but you're probably better off starting them in your basement. Okay. <laughs> so if we want to move them out of the basement, greenhouse is the direction we would need to go. You could try, I would try it in a hoop house first. Okay. Um, the other thing, and I didn't mention this with low tunnels, go back to low tunnels. The nice thing about them being so short is that if you know it's going to be below freezing, you can always throw a blanket over that for an extra layer of um, protection. So, you know, you might, tr actually, I would try low tunnels first because okay. it's, it's easier to do that than it would be on a hoop house. Okay, thank you. Sure. Uh, there, there's a question that says, you mentioned that most home greenhouses are too small. What size of greenhouse for a small family do you think makes sense? We grow flowers and veggies, but have been starting seeds inside, which end up taking over our entire living room. So I would think about how much space you're using in your living room and think about how you know, how you can do it more efficiently, because obviously if it's all over your living room, you know, you have living space and, um, and all of that. But think about how you would do it in a, um, in a more sort of row fashion instead of kind of wherever in the house. Um, and then do the math on that. And again, make sure that you have uh, enough for walkways and enough to get your wheelbarrow back and forth. But that's how I would calculate it. I see that Joy had her hand raised. I, I did, sorry. Uh -huh. I was wondering how many, um, how many, what do you call those, barrels would you need for like a 10 by 12 greenhouse? How many bells? Barrels. Oh, barrels. Black barrels. Mm -hmm. um, typically, they're they're in two level banks, and back to that picture somewhere in here. There we go. So typically, they're in two level banks, and then you want. I mean, in an ideal situation, you want that bank as almost as long as your greenhouse. Okay. But there are some situations, like if you have a greenhouse like this, um, you could put a bank of them 
over here next to the slow side, you wouldn't have to double them. And mm -hmm. that would that would soak up that um, winter sun that's coming in at a low angle. Okay. So pretty much the, the whole length of the, of the greenhouse. For the most part. I mean, it's it depends on how cold it gets where you are, really. I'm in Virginia Beach. Virginia Beach, you probably wouldn't need that. You wouldn't need as many. Um, I don't know what Virginia Beach winters are like, but um, I would imagine they're not very, well, they're not as severe right. um, as, as they are in other places. Okay, it, it rarely freezes. I mean, we get a couple of really cold nights, but it doesn't, you know, unless you that winter a few years ago with how many inches we got, that's not normal at all. Um, Okay, I have a I have a backyard that's south facing, so it's pretty hot back there. Yeah, in that case, I would I would um, think about a thermal blanket or something to throw over it, um, okay. because that'll he keep the heat in at night, and you won't have to clutter up your greenhouse with barrels. Right. And you would only have to use it on nights where you know it's going to be cold. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Uh, Diane Blust has a question. Um, yeah, hi, thanks. I have. I live up in Harpers Ferry, um, West Virginia, so just across the, the hills from Loudoun County, and I have a south-facing glass, um, essentially four-season sunroom that I mm -hmm. put on the south side of my garage. Um, it rarely goes below even 35 degrees in there it has to get really cold in the winter for for um for it to go below freezing uh, in fact i don't think it's ever gone below freezing but i have a problem i just grow things in in uh, pots uh in the winter greens and things like that I have a huge problem with fungus gnats um and i was just wondering what you have to say about that in in pots mm, fungus gnats um Fungus gnats are hard to control inside. Oh, they're hard to control generally. Um, I would let, I would change your soil and I would look at your watering. Um, try not to overwater because uh, usually it's that damp, moist soil that's going to be a breeding ground for those. Failing that, um, Sometimes you can find those mosquito dunks in granular form. Oh, yeah. Those can sometimes help with fungus gnats, just put, sprinkling a, a little bit on the top of the soil. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll try. Yeah, that's the, um, the mosquito dunks. I forget what the... Uh, BT. B, yeah, BT. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Um, yeah, okay, great. Thanks so much. Sure. Michelle has her hand raised next. Hi, um, I am over here in Asheville, North Carolina, and I grow flowers. And this year I am trying to do, I'm, I'm using landscaping fabric to control the weeds because it's such a, ooh, such a big thing here um, with the summers and the rain and the heat that right. we get. and. Um, I'm wondering, I'd like to try doing low tunnels this year over some of my beds. I've planted some hardy annuals already, and so my hope is that they're going to overwinter, and they'll start earlier in the spring because I've planted them early, but I obviously need to keep them warm, and my plan was to try to do low tunnels, but I'm coming up against a little um technical issue that i'm just curious if anybody has experience with which is how do i drive the rebar into the ground where i already have landscaping fabric the easiest way would be to um, take a knife and puncture that landscape fabric mm -hmm. and then put the uh the rebar in and drive it in okay okay and then what I was planning on doing was ordering um, frost cloth fabric from Johnny's 
And um, I'm wondering what the difference is between what you, you, you named spun cloth and polyfilm. Mm -hmm. um, and wondering what you would recommend I use as, as the cloth over top of this. I was going to do the PVC method like you talked about. So it depends on, uh, well, I would recommend polyfilm because it holds the heat better. Um, okay. The downside to that is you're going to have to water from time to time. I see. Okay. Um, Generally speaking, the, the spun fabric, you can get it kind of thick, but even then it's, if you get really thick spun fabric, it may work. Um, I'm, thinking about the hills of North Carolina and how cold it gets. Um, that would let the rain in, or at least let some rain in. Um, and by having it hoop, that would shed snow. Yeah, we don't get a lot of snow, um, maybe like three or four times in a winter, and it doesn't usually stay for long. Okay. Um, but okay so you're saying the polyfilm would keep it warmer but i'd have to water it yeah um okay but again with the spun cloth if you knew it was going to get really really cold again you could throw a blanket over top of it yeah okay great thank you i think that that's all for my questions okay there's a question from Janine. How important is a sunny location for a greenhouse hoop house? Would a shady location not work as well? Well, with shade, you know, you've got less sun coming in to begin with. Um, so that might be a problem depending on what you're trying to grow and what its light requirements are. It would be an advantage in the... Uh, in the summertime because that shade would help reduce the heat. But I would, I would check on, you know, what the light requirements are for the plants you're growing. Um, and you didn't mention about grow lights in greenhouses, but maybe um, could you talk about that a little? So, if you're trying to extend the season with plants that are sunlight sensitive, um, you want to need, you're going to need grow lights um, to supplement the light in the wintertime because, of course, the sun is going down earlier and it's rising later. There are a lot of LED lights that ha require little um, electricity that can be used. Um, they're better than the fluorescence in terms of lasting longer, and they've got about the same light rating. Um, but again, that takes power, and again, you have to think about your structure. Um, you know, are you going to have enough supports to hang those lights down? Um, and that goes back to your design. You want to make sure that you're designing it so that if you're going to have lights, it's going to have that structure, like in this particular case. You know, there's not really a whole lot of room for you to hang stuff from the ceiling. So this might not be a candidate for lights, um, but other shapes. And depending on how much support they have, like this uh, Quonset style, you know, depending on what your spacing is, depends kind of on how much load uh, each individual is going to carry. Um, you know, those lights aren't that heavy, but it's just one more thing to think about. And there's also inexpensive um, alternatives to lights that are branded as grow lights, correct? Correct, yeah. Um, a lot of times you don't need the actual grow lights. You just need something that is a full spectrum light. Um, and then the last resource page, I believe Christina is going to send out it, with the uh, evaluation. Oh, so, good. So yeah. Usually she does that. And just checking one more. So the recording will be on our YouTube channel if you came in later. Yes, and that should be up by Friday.
Friday. And we did sunny location. And okay, that looks like anybody else have another question for Thomas. Um, oh, what is the YouTube page? That's been um, Nancy uh, or Linda put that above if you go through the comments. It says from the help desk to everyone. There's the link. It'll also come with the. Um... There we go. Thank you, Nancy. And it will be sent out with the evaluation. Evaluation. There is a greenhouse video already up there. It's we've done this. This is the second time we're doing this because of demand. And this has a little bit more than the first one we did, um, just as an FYI. Well, thank you all for coming. We appreciate it. Um, next week we have, what do we have next week? I believe we have what to expect from your landscaper. Mm -hmm. And that should be an interesting talk. Thank you all very much. Again, remember to fill out your evaluations when you get them. And we will see you next time. Thank you, Thomas. That was great. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. If you enjoyed this video, please let us know with your questions, comments, and suggestions for other classes and videos. We can be reached at master gardener at pwcgov.org. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next week.